a great pleasure to be with you all this morning as, as another of the representing a very good uh, team from the South African, uh, that, that did the South African study. Um, it, uh, uh, Vimal Ranchard, who's here, and myself uh, are writing the, the summary paper. That's how come our names are up there. Um, I'll, t I'll tell you who the other players are as we go. Um, uh, like the other studies, uh, there's been a lot of work on South African inequality. And uh, we know lots of things. It's, it's a very, very unequal society. Uh, one of the most unequal societies in the world. Uh, pre previous work has placed the income genie around 0.65 um, with lots of debate about the data and the et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it, that doesn't shift the very high level that none of those debates <coughs> change the fact and its effect. It has a history too. Uh, and so history doesn't start when the surveys arrive. And so one of the analytic issues that we confront in, in, in South Africa is to take some sort of stock of initial conditions or call it what you like, because otherwise, if you're doing the changes and, and similar to all the other country studies, our focus is, is more on explaining some of the changes in inequality as the value add rather than just measuring um, the inequality. Uh, so our history doesn't go away. You have to somehow bring it into the surveys. Um, so we, we produced uh, four papers. They, they, they're quite similar in the topics because the, these are areas that we had thought in the broader project would add value to our understanding of inequality in developing countries. Um, and... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the, the first paper was a sort of a context setting paper in which we did the type of decomposition exercises that we've, we've seen for the other countries where you take, in this speci specific case, you take income sources and you decompose uh, the changes over time. I guess that was the value add in, in our exercise. We, we saw exactly that exercise in the Brazilian data and we, in fact, we got the technique from, from our Brazilian uh, collaborators. Um, and uh, we have done many decomposition exercises in South Africa. The, uh, we've de decomposed everything in sight, between and within race group, between and within rural areas, etc. Uh, and so the, the, and we redid the static decomposition exercises, you know, using slightly more updated, taking the story up to 2014, just to make sure we were getting the same story. And it is the same story in a static sense, of the dominance of wage income in, um, in, in dominating the household per capita income earnings distribution. Uh, and uh, uh, that is what the static decomposition shows, but it also hides quite a lot because, because uh, it doesn't take account, for example, South Africa has implemented a huge cash transfer system over the post-apartheid period. Now, if you take a cross-section and you do an income source decomposition, you're never going to pick up the impact of, <coughs> of that because it's, it's embedded in the data. Uh, the dynamic decompositions help a bit in that regard. They also in, allow you to bring in demographic change because the denominator in these exercises is household size or something, which you can also then decompose, in our case, into um, adults, you know, the, the share of adults in the household and the share of employed adults in the household. And so some of the changes that we've been attributing to income sources are actually due to substantial change in the demography, greatly reduced household size in South Africa, which increases the number of adults per household. Uh, but then you've got an underperforming labor market. Um, so uh, enough said, so what do we find from this exercise? It doesn't take away the key finding, and you wouldn't expect it to. It's very hard to think of a society where the, the drivers of, of uh, the dynamics of inequality aren't going to feed through the labor market. I, it's just hard to think about that. Uh, and so the labor market is still very important. But some of the demographic changes in, uh, do lower the contribution then straight of the wage income coming into the household. So as I said earlier, the number of adults per household has increased, but our labor market hasn't been great. And so the, the share of employed adults in the household 
um, hasn't increased so much, but if you're in a smaller household, they, they can make their contribution. There's complicated uh, demographics there that have, have lowered inequality. So if you just look at the income source, of the wage contribution, it looks as though the wage contribution has gone down. Uh, not, not, not become equalizing, but become less disequalizing in the recent period. If you take out the demographic changes, that goes away. The wage income itself hasn't become, uh, hasn't dampened. Um, and then uh, there's uh, the, the social grants then kick in. If you look at the densities in South Africa and you take a with, but, you know, you take the social, include the social grants and you take them out, the whole bottom of the distribution changes. It's implausible that, a, that an income source decomposition can say, wait, well, social grants are doing nothing. It doesn't make sense. If you do the dynamic decomposition, you can see it has a big redistributive impact. It, pick, it picks up in the changes. Um, so, uh, and, th and that's very interesting and very important, I think. Uh, the, the, the aggregate trend seems to suggest that our inequality sort of topped out in about 2008 and has decreased a little bit since then. Other data shows it, it definitely shows a flattening, but doesn't show the decrease. Now, the, the, we've been using the data for this exercise was the National Income Dynamic Study, which is a panel data survey. And, um, and one of the issues, obviously, with panel data is attrition. And the, who, who attrits out of panel data? The wealthier sections of, of the data set attrit. They don't like telling you about their stuff, right? Um, and, and so these issues about the data quality and, and whether that uh, decline in inequality is really real and a need to explore the top end of the income distribution has, a, has an obvious resonance. It's not just because that's what everybody's doing. There's some logic to it. So the second paper had a look at the top end uh, of the distribution beginning to merge tax data and, um, and these surveys, uh, following methodologies in the team. Uh, what, what we did in this particular exercise um, we, the idea was to use the surveys for the bottom end of the distribution and the, and the tax data for the top, but where, do you, where is that threshold point? Um, in this particular paper, which was produced um, by, by Ingrid Willard and, uh, uh, and her, survey, uh, her student Janina Hundenborn and um, uh, Jan Jelsema from the World Bank, um, they, they, they wanted to use the, the thresholds in which you actually have to file tax returns and motivated uh, for, for the use of those data, um, applied those thresholds, and then, uh, so basically you use the, the NIDS data before the threshold and then you use the, the uh, tax data above the threshold. Um, and the estimated Gini coefficient of taxable income, be, be, you know, be careful here. So the 0.66 I was talking about earlier on is the disposable income. Um, this is income before tax, uh, is 0.83, uh, which then does also decrease. Um, I don't know if you can see this. It will certainly make sure you're, uh, you're still awake. Uh, Basically, this is the difference in the mean income between the, the tax, the NIDS data minus the tax data. So you don't have to report at the bottom, but some people do. So you do have tax data across the distribution. And anyway, the, the graph just makes, uh, is quite intriguing because it, you can see at the bottom end, the tax data, there's a huge difference in a positive. NIDS gets much higher income levels than the tax data at the bottom end. Um, with all the problems of n not many people actually reporting there. In the middle, it's very flat. It's sort of the same. Uh, and then at the top, you can see that the NIDS data is substantially below the, the, um, the, uh, the tax data. And so it's likely <coughs> Without getting too pernickety about this percentage point, you know, we can explain, et cetera, et cetera. But that decline in inequality that we see, uh, you know, in, from 2008 to 2014 is, is probably not there 
to the extent that it's there. And the other data triangulating implies uh, that it's not there. And if you then look into the labor market, which is what the third paper does, because the labor market still is the driver and it's the driver of the changes and it's going to have to, it's going to, have to be the driver of the transformative impacts on our, on our society. Uh, so we had a very hard look at the, at the labor market earnings inequality situation in South Africa, and we have a, a very good data set. It's called the Post-Apartheid Labor Market Series. It's publicly available, if I can put in a little advertorial. Uh, it's basically Statistics South Africa data, but uh, one of the data units at, at the University of Cape Town has worked very hard to harmonize mm -hmm. the data, give you harmonized weights for appropriate comparisons over time, uh, et cetera. Um, make sure definitionally the, the income, the earnings variables measure the same stuff. Uh, and so we had a close look at this inequality uh, thing. The, f two points, two key points came up. We did some complicated things. Well, they're complicated for us. We're learning as we go. So we did some recentered influence function regressions. We learned from our partners in the network. Uh, and to look across the distribution, not just to look at uh, average effects. Um, and I'll give you the findings of those. But first, we found this huge break in the data. In 2011, the inequality, if you just plot it, you're not riffing anything. You're just plotting the Gini. There's this jump in the Gini coefficient in the data at one point. It's implausible. Well, it's, it's, it would be plausible, but you'd have to construct a story of something happening in South Africa, a meteor hit or something. Um, and and the, so we explore this data break, and it makes a huge difference to everything we do. If you ignore the break, inequality goes up, right? It jumps up. And so basically, we've got a problem. We've got a data problem that you have to confront. And uh, uh, if you stretch across that band, what we do show in the paper is that the RIF exercises you do give very, very different answers to if you do to stop just before the break. Uh, and so that's very important, we think. And the world, for example, there's a World Bank country report that was released this year that ignores the break. And so it makes too much of a big deal about the explosion in the earnings inequality in the labor market. It has gone up over time. It hasn't gone up like that. And that's really important. Uh, so what did we find in the roofing thing? Nothing fantastically interesting, but all important, uh, I think. You know, For example, the changes in the returns in the labor market, which you've even picked up in the average earnings, earnings function type thing, but become very, very important in allocating you across the distribution, um, for example. Moving towards policy, the, the, our country studies then closed with a paper uh, that, uh, again, uh, Ingrid Willard wrote with uh, Mashukwe Maboshe, um, one of our young researchers, PhD students in the School of Economics, um, that does a benefit incidence type exercise. Uh, these have been done before. We updated to a, more, uh, to a more recent year using something called the South African Living Condition Survey. We've got good data in the country, and it's made publicly available by our stats agency. Um, and so we extended it. So there are two contributions, really. One is the extension, but we also focused on a few issues that, that hadn't been explored before. Tax exemptions in the distribution of disposable income, like we, we looked at their role. Um, and uh, uh, th then one can look at the, the, the impact by, by race group or gender or age. Um, we find if, if uh, the red and the blue, uh, the red and the blue reflect is the big story here. It, it tells you, uh, if the, let me start with the dotted line, which is market income. So that's the inequality of South African society. That's your, your market income. The fact that the Lorenz curves for or concentration curves really for um, the tax income is so much below that implies a, a, that the upper end of the distribution are being taxed, right? It's a very progressive, well, it's a progressive tax structure. It's not quite as progressive as it looks, which is what the careful um, exercises in, the, in this paper show. But that's what we've got. We've got a progressive tax structure. 
Uh, and it's partly a product of our inequality, right? The very, very low incomes at the bottom, you don't pay much tax on that. That's not because we've got a well, necessarily a progressively designed tax structure. So some of it's about the design, but some of it's about South African inequality. Um, uh, this, this graph then just shows you two of these sort of deductibles, if you like, in the tax system that we haven't looked at in the country before. Uh, are the, you only start paying tax on interest income above a threshold of, of interest earnings, and you, only, and you get a medical tax credit. You can claim back private expenditures uh, that you put into your medical aid. You can claim back through the tax system which is really important if you're trying to articulate the health equity in the country and the, and the mesh between public and private. Uh, you can see here that they are very regressive. And there's other uh, good work in, in this particular paper that shows, for example, how a value-added tax, certain components of value-added tax are very regressive too. Um, and there's some stuff that we haven't yet got the data for. So there's work to be done. <coughs> for example, uh, the capital gains tax is a very important component of the South African system. Now, you've got to dive into the tax data. It doesn't, we don't have it yet. It hasn't been articulated yet, but it's almost there, ready for us. And it's very, very important. And then the wealth data uh, isn't well done. So um, quickly, the big picture coming out of this slide is that our, our cash transfers are very, very uh, focused on the bottom end of the distribution. They're very pro-poor. Um, and so that affirms the household level study that we started out with. Um, but now we've dived into government, right? So this is now admin data combined with survey data, part of the richness of the study. So our main findings, our, our taxes are progressive. Uh, with the top three deciles contributing 96% of personal taxes, uh, our t cash transfers are highly progressive, um, and, and they reduce the Gini coefficient quite dramatically if you do it properly in the change. Uh, tax exemptions, however, are regressive. Um, we, we did lots of other work to, uh, we've done lots of other work on the side of the project that resonates with what else you've been told. <coughs> We, we've uh, used our panel data in particular to tell a story of very regressive. Um, uh, the, this is the intergenerational uh, mobility story that came up in, in a few other papers, and it's a dreadful story. So I keep con on contentiously calling it intergenerational failure whenever I talk about this in South Africa. Because these are uh, co conditional upon some quite sophisticated modeling for these initial conditions, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. This is a sort of a, a father-son, a, a parent-child um, correlation, if you like, uh, coming out of some modeling work. And you can see this is sitting at 0.9, right? So it's not the straight correlation, the 0.7 that would, was, was the Premier League in, in Latin America. That's not a fair comparison. It's not the straight correlation. But nonetheless, this is devastating, right? This is how South African society is reproducing itself. Uh, so not only do we have high inequality, but we're not really, uh, it's persistent. Uh, we've done other work on the poverty dynamics and the middle class dynamics that also show a very slowly transforming South Africa. Um, I'll leave that for now. Uh, so final point then. So the study, I think our studies have made some contribution in pushing on a little bit uh, in the knowledge base, but they've only then surfaced the next round of issues, which are then about uh, the, the sort of social process, social and economic and labor market processes that drive the inequality. The, these decompositions are proximate uh, drivers, if you like. You've still got to work out how come education is better years of schooling massive change in years of schooling hasn't translated into better outcomes for South Africa. How's the labor market working, et cetera, et cetera. And that's then the next issue uh, that, that we're dying to confront, uh, hopefully with our lovely partners. Thank you.